Well, hello. Welcome to Pick Up the Mic, Harvest Church's podcast. I am Mike Reiner, lead pastor at Harvest. With me, it, well, we have a producer here named Tom Cruz, Cruiser Tom, uh, we call him. And we also have uh, our executive pastor, Mr. Will Land. What's up, everybody? And uh, today, where are we going today, Will? Well, yeah, last week uh, we touched on a sermon you did about trust, trusting the Lord, um, being content in all things. And we we took that in a bit of a different direction, covered anxiety, how anxiety um, factors in uh, trusting the Lord and, and some different practical strategies as fallen human beings for dealing with anxiety. And, and since then... Um, before and after Thanksgiving week, we did sermons on, you did sermons on tithing and investing. So I feel like this week's a great time to get into perspective on your life and your stuff. Uh, yeah. Thanksgiving is, um, uh, it's funny because most of the giving people do in the year is normally the end of the year, which is the same time I'm always broke because of Christmas and all these doggone kids and grandkids, and not being able to stop myself from buying things, and and my wife's the same. So, but many people, it's their giving time, uh, end of the year, taxes, or I don't know why. Why is that? you think you'd want to give in May, but nothing's happening. You're just chilling. It ties into both holidays. I mean, you have Thanksgiving, which is literally your you're giving thanks to the Lord, and then it's a very charitable time of year, and then that leads right into the gift-giving season in Christmas. So I feel like it probably just fits naturally for that to also be uh, philanthropic so have you season. Noticed, have you noticed this new day they call Giving Tuesday? No, I'm out of touch. What's Giving Tuesday? It's, 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 um, it's all over the place. Right after Cyber Monday. There's... Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and now Giving Tuesday. People matching gifts, and, and everyone's into it. I get mailers in the mail. You know, this is, I knew this is just what we were missing in our society, is another day oh, gosh. To, to specify this a should certain be a activity. Ribbon. There should be a yeah, ribbon. Yeah, we need a, a ribbon, ribbon for it. For we don't have enough ribbons or days to devote to yeah. things. So what I do on Giving Tuesday, I make it my Get Lost Tuesday. If I'm giving to you, I'm going to do it. Wednesday. I just don't want to play the game. I'm not yeah. doing Giving Tuesday. I'm giving wait till Wednesday. <laughs> so a lot of people give. And here's the interesting thing is people give to those who ask. I think all of us, we're more prone to being generous when we're asked than we think we are. And That's church, true for me. For and, sure. and yet churches don't often ask. But if they do ask, they get wrecked by critics for asking. Um, so I don't, I'm, I've never been a big asker for money. Uh, I just, but not because I'll get wrecked. It, I just don't think to do it. So do you think that, this is totally off the cuff, but do you, th do you think there's a factor there of like manliness, American self-sufficiency, you personally don't like asking for help in things and therefore that translates into that last bit i don't know about manliness or anything like that but um i personally don't like to ask a lot um for money yeah you know um for help i might ask for help uh mainly because i've learned that when someone's expert at something or better at something than i am they enjoy showing me how to do it and helping me do it. And, and so I'm not ruining their day, but no one ever says you made my day. You took all my money. So <laughs> that's, that's a different thing. And that might be part of it, or I just don't think of it that much, uh, strategically, but I would say this on the subject, everyone's going to ask you for money as a, anyway, this season. And if you're a Christian, you get more asks. And I think better asks a lot better causes sometimes, Invest in your church first. That's what I do. Um, not just with the tithe. I think the tithe, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, is an act of worship. You should let go of the first tenth that you're given from God as an act of worship. It's an older. It's the oldest act of worship there is, is giving the first fruits. For some reason, God made us and taught us immediately from the very first people 
this is a way you keep yourself properly, I guess, centered and relating to me and relating to the goods I give you. I give you everything. You go get it. Give me back the first bit. I don't even understand why that's so important to God, but it is that important to God. So tithing to your church, giving, a, it's first for you an act of worship and a liberation and in a showing of trust in God. But secondly, like in the temple worship, it supports the priests, quote, it supports the workers, both the pastors as well as the missionaries or any good deed your church does as well as their 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 uh, daily costs. But at, above that, if God has blessed you above that, think first of your church because any church that's doing good ministry uh, hopefully is using up the money they're given. What good is it if it sits in a bank? Um so if, it, if they're just putting it in a bank, maybe after your tithe, you go ahead and give it to someone else. But I think if you have a church that you love, you should, you should be generous there. Um, I guess I could ask every November, remember when Giving Tuesday comes, we, God will match your gift. For every dollar you give, God will give you 10 pieces of gold in heaven. That's right. And just on <laughs> Giving Tuesday, your gift will be matched. So make sure you write your checks to your favorite church, which is my church. I mean, I could do that, I guess. But I, I think people should think about that. Somebody's asking me for my money all the time. You send them money. What are they going to do with it? Well, they're going to support their organization. They're going to pay their people. They're going to pay their bills. They're going to pay their advertising, and they're going to use whatever's left over for whatever they said they needed it for. And there's nothing wrong with asking for that, but each one is going to be apportion those monies differently, some better than others. So you you got to think through. You know, if somebody asks me at the grocery store, you know, they, they're always asking you, would you like to give money to the food for the hungry? I'm like, no. <laughs> Why? Because I'm a jerk. I think hungry people should know. But that's what it sounds like. But I don't know where that money goes. Right. I don't know how much of that dollar gets to a hungry person. And I think you should. It's the Lord's money. You're giving it away. I like Samaritan's Purse. But I do know they have overhead. and They pay a lot of people and they have advertising. But I feel good about them. I like giving to Gideons because I know where all their money goes. You know where I like to give to is missionaries. Most mission agencies are going to have uh, nine to twelve percent, and that goes to run their office and all the the support things they actually do. But all the rest goes to the missionary, which is pretty good. Uh, if you can get eighty to ninety percent to go exactly where you want it, that's good because everyone has bills. I don't spite them, the administration taking that, and I can directly give to missionaries and have a relationship with them. They can write me little letters to say thank you for the money. Here's what I'm doing. Uh, but I so I think you should tithe to your church, and then. If God blesses you more, invest in your church first. Then ask missionaries from your church. Um, have a relationship with them. They're never getting rich. Missionaries don't get rich, and they it, and they can use it for the gospel. And then after that, what do I have left that I can share with others? And not, and that doesn't even count generosity you should have towards your family. You got a family, right? You know, share your food, share your cars, share your clothes, share your tools, share your house, and then your friends. Um. Yeah, that we should be very just generous people. Pay for ourselves, yes. Pay our own bills, but then after that, what the heck? My perspective and my perspective on on giving and generosity. I I think it has to change once you become a Christian, right? So from the last few series of texts that you've used, you have the first one, which is life is more than your body. Right. So that when when we're not Christians, you still might have philanthropic ideals and want to give to charities and stuff. And, you know, um, but we we want to have the Christian perspective where from last week's sermon, we're using unrighteous wealth to build up friends in mm. eternal dwellings. Right. So well, you wait, wait, if you're going to say that, can I interrupt? Yeah. Could you explain the parable? Because there could be people who didn't hear the sermon and you just said something remarkable. Using unrighteous, unrighteous wealth. Go ahead and explain that. Yeah. So the parable was from Luke. Um, it's 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 one of Jesus's trickier parables to to unwind, where you have um, an unrighteous household manager of a wealthy man 
who is not managing the wealth of that man wisely, and he's about to get fired. And um, knowing he's about to lose his job, he decides he needs to make friends of the debtors of the wealthy man so that once he gets fired, he'll have the in at other places to potentially go work to get a new job. And so, you know, in a very underhanded way, he cuts deals with the debtors of the wealthy man so that they'll look kindly upon him once he gets fired that, hey, this guy did me a favor. He cut my debt in half. Um, But that wasn't his money he was playing with. It wasn't his money he was playing with. So... And then so the, he was cutting deals with, using his boss's money correct. to make friends of other rich guys. Correct. For his own benefit. For his own so benefit. that once his boss fired him, well, I basically bought off these guys with my old boss's money, hoping that they'll look kindly upon me to give me a job when I get mm-hmm. fired. So the tricky part of the parable is Jesus says when the, when the rich man finds out the backdoor underhanded dealings that his manager was doing to try to make friends, he calls him shrewd, uh, almost compliments him on his backdoor underhanded dealings. And that's that's your original take, but that's, <clears throat> in your sermon, you say, we're not being instructed to copy the exact actions of that man, but his thinking. And Jesus says that, the the sons of this generation are are more shrewd in dealing in worldly things than the sons of light are in in handling like the kingdom of god and the the application then is given by jesus which is rare in the proceeding verse saying use this unrighteous wealth that you're given to manage which is not yours so you're given material goods during your time on earth, which are not yours, they're God's, you're, you're put in management, stewardship over them. Use that material wealth that's going to fade away, fail, burn up in ashes in the end, to make friends in the future eternal places. Basically, use your temporary failing wealth now, wealth being time, talent, everything you have, to uh, get people into heaven. So So, they'll be excited to see you when you're there. So listen, I got to say, I may be out of a job because in five minutes, you just gave my sermon more succinctly and more clearly than I did, and it took me an hour. (laughs) That was awesome. So let me tie that back into my perspective on philanthropy then. Um, I love St. Jude's. It's a children's hospital up in Minnesota. Danny Thomas. They... They do fantastic work treating kids with awful childhood diseases at 100% expense coverage for the family. That's awesome. But life is more than just the body. Yes. And we want to be using our wealth in ways that puts those children into eternal dwellings so we can be friends with them in the future. So if St. Jude's is not also delivering the gospel while they're trying to heal these children and be nice to their families, then maybe that's not a highest priority for me as a Christian. I mean, that, that to me is the connected message from the trust sermon into the tithe and invest sermons is when I, when I look at my own generosity now as a Christian who's trying to think, with a Christian worldview, gospel-centered worldview. um, That, to me, is a a really primary reason why the church, I think, should be your highest priority. You know what the highest priority or focus of the church is. Mm -hmm. It's getting people into eternal dwellings where we can Mm -hmm. hang out in eternity in heaven together. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we do a lot of other material good along the way. We feed the hungry. We, We do material good for people in this in this fallen world now Mm -hmm. but always with the additional focus Mm -hmm. of life is more than just your body we want you to end up in an eternal dwelling with us and so if there is more above the tithe 
you're looking for other places to be generous, I think missionary support's a great one because you know what they're doing mm-hmm. and, and none of those people are, are getting rich. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then beyond that, I would look for philanthropic organizations that include the gospel, that are Christian, that are trying to save souls mm-hmm. while also doing material good in this world. Um, as much as I love St. Jude, I don't think St. Jude is preaching the gospel to families with cancer. Right. So I, I agree. Um, if I could comment, I, I love the way you put all that. I might add um, something I left out before is we also, the church is called to use money to take care of its own members. Now, in America, most members aren't hungry in your church. If they are, they're easy to find, and it doesn't cost much to feed them. And so no church should have starving people, um, and and that should work there too. But even that, in the name of Christ. Uh, we've had people at Harvest um, who've just gotten into a jam for whatever reason, and their electricity is about to be shut off, and we will... We've helped them turn it back on while also saying, let's examine how it happened. And if there's something they could have done to prevent that, we teach them these principles um, so that they don't get in that jam again. If there's nothing they could have done to prevent it, well, then it's just straight gift, if you know what I mean. But um, uh, the when it comes to giving in the gospel, one thing like the Samaritan purse has made this shoebox thing into a worldwide you know they're going to preach the gospel when it gets there. Now, for stuff like St. Jude's, like when I would go through McDonald's, which I don't anymore, but I used to go there and get coffee every morning or many mornings, and whatever change, I... Now where do you get coffee? I go to Mission Coffee. It's the best coffee on the planet. That's right. This is the angel's favorite coffee. If you drink any other coffee, you might just love Satan more than you love God. Um, it's a commercial for <laughs> Mission Coffee. You might not too, but you might. So, um, well, there are Satanists who drink other coffee, right? Uh, yeah, so yeah. that could be true. So I would take the change and I'd stick it in for Ronald McDonald House. Because if you've ever had a sick kid and stuck in a near a hotel or, or near a, a hospital, you can't go home. It's hard. And that's a, there's nothing wrong with doing that as a Christian. There's nothing wrong with writing checks to St. Jude. You want to help people. But when you think about maximizing your money, it sure is nice if you can give it in Jesus' name. And so what I hear you saying is you have to have priorities and think through my little bit of money, where is it going to make the greatest impact? Like if you were really wealthy, I think you could make an even bigger impact, right? You can then donate huge amounts to St. Jude's and do it publicly in the name of Christ. Right. And right. And then they'll say, look, you know, Jesus wants to save the world. He wants to save souls. They will let you say anything if you give them a big enough check. Yeah. Right. <laughs> They'll let you. St. Jude's itself is Catholic. So they have a a brand that's generally Christian brand. Um, and and so there's and there's nothing wrong with any good deed. I think that's what I'm saying. But we want to do all we do in Jesus name. And if you feed a soul, but don't save that soul or at least attempt to. What have you done? Yeah, they can still be punished for their sin and go to hell. And so now, great, you're in hell. Doggone it, you weren't hungry that one day I fed you. Isn't that great? I can feel good about myself. So, um, But living a generous lifestyle is seeing everything we own is belonging to God. Our time belongs to God. This microphone in front of me belongs to God. Um, Cruiser Tom over here belongs to God, our producer. Um, You belong to God. This table belongs to God. This podcast belongs to God. Is it? profitable for him. Hope so. Hope people enjoy it and their life gets better and they give thanks to God for having a better life and it helps somehow. Um, and, and that's and that's why everything you receive, you should give thanks because it belongs to God. So if you can enjoy a cup of coffee, as long as you give thanks when you get it, um, but it all belongs to God. And so therefore, he wants to know, how are you going to manage what I gave you? And, and that's... No one can say, I don't have anything. Right. Unless they don't have anything then they're a newborn baby and that's why generosity is like it's it's all about a perspective shift in your life i mean it it ties right into the gospel with with other core christian doctrine doctrines like forgiveness like how could i not forgive when i've been forgiven of so much right 
if if you switch your perspective to realizing that you didn't earn anything on your own accord in your life and you start acknowledging the gratitude of being given so much how can i not also be willing to share it right like you said in your sermon yeah, good point you know even even just the fact that you were born in this century in this geographic location with these laws was not up to your own will like mm-hmm. Um, you know, you could have been born in 500 AD and who knows where, and good luck starting your McDonald's franchise there. Yeah. You know, it's like, you weren't going to do it. You weren't going to do it. Um, it wasn't there. Or you could have been born in, uh, France during the bu- bubonic plague. Right. And not in the upper classes. Right. You could have been a lower class people. So there's no upward mobility for you. And so you just hope you live through it and find something to eat. Bring out your dead. Right. So so the perspective, you know, once you acknowledge you've been given so much, regardless of how much you feel like you've been given, like that's the change, is that yes. you've been given a lot. Reg- and and uh, John the Baptist, when asked how, what does repentance look like, he said, let him who has two give to him who has none. Now, that's not a law, right? That's just a general way of thinking. I have two coats. I like them both. Oh, you're cold? Well, I like both my coats. Well, if he's cold. Now, in America, where we have such wealth, it's, it's, a lot of times people, your friends have things. You have to yeah. go find some poor people to get to give things to. Uh, but the general, the principle remains the same. If I have more than I need, why not share the more that I need with someone else and bless that person. There's not no reason not to do it. You know, one of the commands that probably we should all remember on Thanksgiving and Christmas and Easter when we gather people together is that there are a lot of people who don't have a family to gather with or they're special needs adults who often they're, they're in group homes and getting home to wherever their family of origin is it's hard, or maybe there's no one who cares, unfortunately. What if, you know, you, you, you got more, you got leftovers, so why not have them over for the meal? You know, learning to invite people over to your meal who don't get invited over. You say, well, that person's not starving. No, but they're not getting a Thanksgiving family either. Why not share? Let him who has two, give to him who has none. It's the same principle. Now you're part of a family. You get to sit here with us and, and, uh, and, enjoys the same laughter and talk and food and football and yeah it's a little more work you got to go pick people up you got to bring them out you got to bring them home but what the heck it's kind of fun too you develop new relationships my mother is really great at this Hmm. thanksgiving for the last decade or so and now even christmas to some respect and in my parents household is somewhat of a mishmash of of wayward people who's either their families have moved far away and they're that's why you know she's never invited me (laughs) so she what did i do wrong mom you you have your own family oh that's it (laughs) um but it's great and then you know those people have now come back several times we have a couple regulars that are not part of the family that that come to thanksgiving at our house (laughs) and now they're kind of like part of the family yeah they won't leave it's it's kind of nice it's a it's a great representation of it hospitality is and hospitality and love, and and that should be the way we live our whole lives. The the thing we get to be a manager of God's stuff is a privilege, and the cool thing is it doesn't matter how much you have. You know, can I do it? I only have a little. Yeah. Oh, cool. This is I can share my little. Yeah. With with other people, you never get happy being stingy. Now I'm not I'm not in favor of foolish financial lifestyle, but I'm also I'd also say that thinking that you have a moral responsibility to get a maximum uh, return on investment uh, financially is a mistake when you could get a maximum spiritual return on your investment. It's the same money. Um, Sure, had I put that extra in the bank, I could have paid off my car loan faster because we invited six people and it cost an extra $100 for the stuff we bought them. Yeah, I could have. But that's just money in the bank. I'm actually giving to real live human people. And there's people who get so much money that make so much money. And I know there's not a lot, but it just piles up. What are you going to do with it all? 
uh, give it to your kids. Okay, you're hoping your kids are faithful to God. Otherwise, that's wasted, believe it or not. Um, and second, money's value could drop any day. Do I mean, gold could become worthless. Things can be stolen. Now all your money is electronic. Some goober over in in you know in Bangladesh could just click 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 boom or, you're broke or goober down in Washington D.C. when the banks fail them yeah they, they yeah. do a bail in yeah yeah they could they could do that or you could be a trucker in Canada and they, and they just take your money cut away. you off yeah well if you already spent it you go ha 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 you can't take my money I already spent it well here's something. <laughs> so- <laughs> This is kind of random, but but it, it crossed my mind earlier. So this this development of a generous spirit, right? It's kind of a well, well maybe it's just my presumption, but I feel like the the general presumption now is the generous spirit is developed a little bit later along in your maturation as a Christian, right? It's 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 part of the Christian walk as you start to become more mature you that's generally when you see people becoming more generous maybe that's an unfair uh stereotype that's my stereotype is generosity is normally later in the path of infancy to adolescence to maturity in the christian walk but you brought up cain and abel earlier and and i'm thinking i'd never thought of it before so i'm interested on your take it seems like right there from like one of the earliest stories we get out of the bible the tithe and the giving back to God and the perspective of all your stuff is God's in the first place and you're just borrowing it is like step one in the Christian walk. Like here's Cain, who we wouldn't call a mature believer, but he's participating in the offering. Like it's mm. it's very early in his in his walk of faith or walk well, of Well, I think you hit on it. So I think what you're saying about the gradual part. There's two reasons why generosity is gradual. One is evil. One isn't. One is ignorance. And I think a lot of people are just ignorance. Nobody told me. If you have a a society like the Jews had, and definitely like Cain and Abel had, or Abraham and Isaac had, they saw dad do it. They saw him burn stuff. They saw him do it in front of them religiously instructed from the earliest age right and so that's what you do and and you can teach your children that and you should because our churches don't really give you that opportunity and i'm not saying they should necessarily change but it could just be ignorant someone has to teach you this is the right way to handle it um the other though is is more more devilish and that is you have to have your heart broken because you're just a greedy person and and Paul says, be um, no, Jesus says, Paul also says it, but Jesus has a better quote that came to me. He said, some guy came to him and he said, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus said, who made me your arbiter? And then he said, be on your guard for every kind of greed. He called that guy greedy. Now, if my inheritance was unfairly split, I think fair would be you get half, I get half. There's two of us. Jesus called it greed. We have greed in our hearts. So greed could stop someone instead of ignorance, and that's devilish. And and I also think there are some who, just by God's grace, are given a hospitable nature, and they quickly connect, if I want to be hospitable, I have to be generous, because you can't be hospitable without being generous. And, and so some are, well, sure, but even them, if they're ignorant of where they're supposed to give their money, they won't, or what, or how they're supposed to worship with it. I should say, they they will do it haphazardly. So there's more than one reason. But but what what you're asking is, shouldn't it be from the get go? Yes, it should. Yes, it should. Um, there's no regimented school. When you see, it'd be cool if you could say, well, I became a Christian. Good. Now you're in school. What do you got to do? Now that you're a Christian, here's class one. Here's class two. Here's class three. You have to take them. We we set up. We, you can set those up in churches. Normally they call membership classes or something, but people say, oh, I don't want to take it. Well, you're not kicking them out of the church for not taking a class. So, and maybe yeah. we should. No, I'm joking. Maybe we that should. That was a joke, everybody. Maybe we should. No, we won't. <laughs> we won't. At least I won't. <laughs> Will might. No. 
<laughs> so more thoughts on generosity. Um, give me your stuff. <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> well, I do think here's here's a thought to keep in mind, and that is you don't have to have a need. A person doesn't have a need for you to be generous with him or her. Mm. Right? It That's good. The, yeah, Jesus did say, don't just give gifts to the rich who can give gifts back to you. But his point was, your motive for giving shouldn't be so I get something back. Because that's really not a gift, is it? That's a, that's a, that's a thought through transaction. Strategy. Your right? strategy. It's a strategy. I'm giving you this now. He's going to give it to me later. And he said, invite people who are poor and things. And you should do that. But if you feel generous with someone who has, give to him. Um, you can't say, well, he already has enough. Why should I give him this thing? Why wouldn't you? Just to love him. God lavishes grace on us. And when you give people things, they feel loved. And normally, they're going to feel a little more generous themselves. So that's not why you do it. But they're going to think, hey, that was fun getting something. I'm going to give it. So as Christmas season comes, um, I, have a, I have a running uh, debate in my mind with many members of my family, including my wife. And this isn't to run any of them down, but the women are so practical. They're like, it's your birthday coming. What do you want? And I'm like, I want you to surprise me. <laughs> it's a gift. Work, work for this sucker. Um, it's more fun if I don't know what I'm getting. But sometimes they'll say that and I'll think, I'll get greedy. I'll think, well, here's something I wouldn't buy, <laughs> but you're going to, but so that's the running argument. My wife and her whole family work on lists. If you give a list, they just start work checking off the list. And I think this is just a big transaction. Oh, it's man. not a gift. Now, I'm not criticizing the way they do it just because I don't like it. There's nothing wrong with exchanging gifts that way if that's the way you want to do it. But here's what I do want to get at. Enjoy giving and enjoy getting. Because if you don't enjoy getting, the giver is going to be disappointed. So even if you're like my wife and her family, and you told them, buy me a power drill, and they buy you a power drill. Don't go, eh, I knew that you were going to give me this. Say, thank you. It's so nice of you to think of me. And they'll say, I didn't think of you. You told me to get you this. Still nice of you to buy it. Because enjoy receiving things. Because it takes all the fun out of giving. If No one wants to hear when they give you something. You shouldn't have. Take it back. You're like, I worked to get this stupid thing. And, and here, But here's one thing I would urge you. Stop buying gift cards. They're so lazy. I know everyone. And they bought, my family buys them all the time. I'm not picking on anybody. They're so like, I knew I had to buy you something. And people say, well, they want to shop there anyway. Let them choose what they want. There's just no art. There's no, I guess I'm vetching. I'm vetching like an old Jewish woman. They vetch. It's a Yiddish word. And why don't you just think about these things? Think about the people in your life. Buy them nice gifts. Don't you know who they are? Why do you have to just give them gift cards? Here's your gift card. Um, wouldn't it be nice just to think about a human and think, he'd like this. I'm going to buy this for him. And if he says, I don't like it, at least he knows you were thinking about him. And I think that's better. Anyway, I'm done. I, I'm sorry. I no, did it's not, funny. I'm... I took myself down that own rabbit trail. I chased myself. <laughs> I'm, I'm coming back home. I... I... In our family, it's it's a it's a hundred percent reversed. I'm the one who's tempted to always want a list. I like to give people lists because I have things that I want, and I don't like them guessing because generally they guess incorrectly. But they love you. <laughs> they do love me. And you know, uh, I love it when my wife tries the, to get me gifts. She gives me strange things. The like women that. in my family they love trying to come up with a surprise. And and uh, let's hear and, it for the women in your but family. I, I will totally second. Regardless, be excited. Yes. Be a gracious receiver of gifts. Share the joy. If nothing the else. The reciprocal joy of They took of gift the giving. time to buy for you. Exactly. They took the time when they were at Giant Eagle buying stuff for themselves anyway to grab a gift card and say, put 30 bucks on this for you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. I love it. Uh, why don't uh. we just all write each other a check for a certain amount and exchange it every Christmas? We all get the same amount. We walk away. <laughs> Mary stinking Christmas wasn't that fun. Right. Um, all right. <laughs> you better move on. All right. I'm losing my mind here. So, so with that, uh, let's get back into Luke. Speaking of Christmas, oh, the Gospel of the Dr. Gospel Luke. of Luke. So Doctor Luke. So a little recap. 
we're in Luke chapter one. We uh, we ended verse thirty nine last podcast. Um, so at this point, an angel has appeared to Zacharias, mm-hmm. scared Gabriel. scared the pants off him in the temple. He was mute. Excuse me. Elizabeth got pregnant, hid it for six months. Then an angel, same angel, Gabriel appeared to Mary, told her she was going to be pregnant with, uh, with, I'm trying to think of all this. Yeah, Jesus. I was trying to think of the three. I forgot him. I didn't forget him. I was trying to think of the three descriptors he got. He got, um, he's the king, the Davidic king. Let me see if you get the son of God. He's the, and the great. First one's so that's the, pretty good. Son of the Most High. Son of the Most High. And on the throne of on David. On the throne of David. And, and the first called, one is great. He'll be called great. He'll be called great. I knew great was in there. That's outstanding. Um, and so where we left off is uh, Mary's super excited and wound up because Gabriel just told her that her her cousin, or yes, her cousin's pregnant I'm and uh, and she is going to have the Son of the Most High. And so Mary travels to go visit Elizabeth. And so that's where we're at in that story. So in verse 39, it says, At this time Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country to a city of Judah. Now, to see Elizabeth. Now, I, this is one of my favorite pastimes every Christmas is destroying everybody's Christmas fables and and destroying everyone's live nativity scene. Here, here. Here, here. What, what happens is Mary... When you travel from the Galilee region to Jerusalem, which is a very normal thing to do because of all the festivals. How many times a year would they do it? Several. Yeah. Several. Depending on their ability financially or health and whatever, every festival they try to get to or they're supposed to. And they would go in groups. They would go in groups because it's safer. They, you don't travel alone. For every for, for, for foreseeable reason, it's safer to go in groups. So they would. And it wasn't hard to make that trip. Okay, it wasn't hard. It wasn't a long journey across the desert on a donkey. Um, and the hill country of Judah uh, is near Bethlehem because Bethlehem's in the hill country of Judah. So we don't know where exactly Elizabeth and Zechariah lived. But Jesus, or Mary made this journey. She probably did not go alone. It said she hurried. But she probably found a way to go. Probably some sort of caravan was on the way. She knew someone, and she jumped in and went along. Well, even if just a bunch of people were walking, you could walk. Just take a few days, 21 miles a day. I don't know how long it takes. But but she made the journey. Um, and we'll get more to that later. But then she entered the house of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And verse 41 says, Elizabeth heard Mary's greetings, and the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. What does that make you think of, Will, about babies? Mm, well, I had my first baby not that long ago. I didn't have my first baby. Mm-hmm. My, that would have been wild. My wife had our first baby, and uh, it's really crazy how active they are in there. Yeah, they move. They're alive. They move a lot. Do you think they're human in there? Ooh, our child has big feet. And towards the end there, I mean, you could literally, you could make out a foot. No way. Uh-huh. Being I thought pressed that was against not the true. side. You really could? Oh, yeah. You couldn't see toes, could you? No, but you could tell it was a foot. Like, a tickler? No. <laughs> but, uh. <laughs> so, so the baby is leaping in her womb, and Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit, and she cried out with a loud voice, Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. The the implication is the Holy Spirit has blessed Elizabeth with knowledge. Um, and how is it to me, has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Doesn't it sound like she knows about the conversation between Mary and the angel? Yeah, I'd say so. So there's only one of two ways. Either Mary has talked and that got to her, or the Holy Spirit told her in the moment. I don't know which the text is saying. It could be that what's left out of this is after they began to talk, she told her about what happened, and the Holy Spirit... um, 
gave her these words, um, or the Holy Spirit told her what happened. But either way, the Holy Spirit is, according to Scripture, inspiring Elizabeth's words. And she said, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Now, as a first-time pregnancy in older age, this is a risky pregnancy. Certainly. So you might think if anything goes wrong at all, a modern doctor would say it's time to terminate the pregnancy, to take advantage of your reproductive freedom, your women's right to control your body, and kill John the Baptist. It's a disgusting thought, but if you believe abortion is a godly thing, as the What's that guy, Pastor Warnock, who's now a senator who from the, the church in Atlanta, who says Christians should be pro-abortion. If you're going to say you're pro-abortion and a Christian, you have to be in favor of the possibility of chopping John the Baptist into small pieces and sucking him out of Elizabeth and thinking that that's not murder. Um, likewise, you have the Savior of the world and the other woman, and you could give her plan B pills so that the, the Jesus, the only begotten son, it was her right because it's her body to slay him. I want to be very clear here in case I haven't been already by using uh, a little bit of satire. It is murder to kill a baby in the womb of a mother. Well, here he's already acknowledged. She, Elizabeth, is acknowledging in verse 43 that he has a, that Jesus is already the Lord. That's right. That's why I'm saying either Mary had to tell her about her visitation or the Holy Spirit told her. Either way, by the Holy Spirit, she's declaring it. So Jesus already has an person, ident- personhood. Yes. And inside of Mary. He's less than a, he's probably a week old. He's probably a week old, two at the most, how depending on how long it took her to get there. Probably a week. Um and the other baby has the ability to have joy. Notice the emotion comes not from the baby's cognition, because a baby in the womb can't think through these things, but the Holy Spirit is actually giving joy to the baby just to be in the presence of the one who in 30 years, the Holy Spirit will again remind John, that's him, and then John will say, there he is. That's the one I've been waiting for. That's what I live for. And and so then in verse 45, it says, blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment Notice that she is saying God has blessed this woman because she had faith. Faith is always the necessary ingredient for salvation. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. What the angel Gabriel had said to her might as well have been the words of the Lord, and she believed. Thoughts or comments on that section? No, I love it. I love all of it. So the next section is called the Magnificat. Um, because people like to drop Latin words. Um, but this is Mary kind of... I love to drop Latin words. You probably know a lot more than most of us, definitely more than me. But um, she's singing a praise song to God or saying a praise song to God, but it, it, it's, it's, it's normally recorded in, in verse and um, assumed to be from the Holy Spirit. But hey, maybe she just dreamed this up herself. But here's what she says. Mary said, My soul exalts in the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior, for he has regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on all generations, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. Look at verse 48, well, and see, do you see the contrast, the, the oxymoronic language there? Um, the irony. What does she call herself in the first line? A humble bond slave. Yeah, and a bond slave is a... It's a slave. It's a slave. Now, a bond slave, most likely, it's a financial arrangement. It could take your yeah. whole life to pay it off. It could take a few years to pay it off. Indentured but, servitude. Yeah, but you're a slave. And humble state of his bond slave. I'm a slave. She's, she's, she's equating herself to not very valuable. And then she says, every generation from now on is going to say blessed. Lady, if you knew the kind of statues they were going <laughs> to You know, uh, Mary, um, my guess is Mary would not recognize the, all the foolishness 
that goes on in her name. Um, the she would not like it. She wouldn't like all the statues. I don't think she like. I know she doesn't like the rosary, which could get me killed in certain circles. But she sees herself as a human being, a bond slave of the Lord, not the mother of God. She is the mother of Jesus, who's the Son of God. But she is not divine, and she does not preexistent, and she's a sinner like the rest of us, and she knows that. And it is she sees in the juxtaposition of her lowness and her being raised. Remember, she's she's poor, as we will find out later. She's a poor person. And that, in any class, in any age, puts you at the lowest position. Now, in America, where we have upward mobility, it's not a disgrace to be poor. But in most countries, it is. It's in most times, she knows that. And she's saying, look at me. I have, and she should be called blessed. She's blessed among women um, to have a baby is to be blessed of God. To have a baby is a gift. It's the greatest gift a woman can be given, um, and and except for Christ Himself. And and she's saying, "I'm the most blessed because I have the best. <laughs> I think I get the best baby." And she does. Well, and it's. I also read that as just. It's a blessing to be a bond slave of the Lord. Like her reaction when Gabriel comes to her a few verses above um it, it's kind of like whatever you want of me yeah i, I am your bond slave so it, so it, it, it might be, be this it might be something else your will be done i'm your servant and then unlike zechariah who said how do i know what you're saying is true Which right gabriel said angel <laughs> and, and here i take this like the juxtaposition is how blessed is it to be a humble bond slave of the Lord. I agree that she is, uh, but I think she is focusing on the blessing inside of her. Because she says in verse 49, for the mighty Mighty one one has done great things for me and holy is his name. And then she goes and she breaks off um, a little bit of Old Testament, Psalm 103 here, and says, and his mercy is upon generation after generation towards those who fear him. And so she's, she knows she's speaking of his nature now. He is a good God. And he is he is good, and then he has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart, and he has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who are humble. So this is her main theme, and it comes up again. You have proud people, and God smashes them, uh, and you have rulers brought low, uh, but the humble. He exalts. And this is a principle that Jesus would teach. He'd say it straight out. The humble will be exalted and the exalted will be humbled. In this world, um, you want to humble yourself (laughs) because if not, you're exalting yourself and God will humble you. Um, But if you humble yourself, God will exalt you. He has filled the hungry with good things. And again, she's quoting the Bible there, Psalm 107, and showing his kindness. Before she said his mercy, now it's his kindness. And he sent away the rich empty-handed. Again, she's putting that that juxtaposition, the word you used. She's saying, look, the hungry people, they're eating now, aren't they? You rich, you're hungry now, aren't you? And he's, it's not happening to anyone, but she's speaking in poetic language. This is what our God does. He, he rescues the hungry. And he has given help to Israel, his servant, that's a nation, in remembrance of his mercy. He spoke to our father's to Abraham and his descendants forever. And Mary stayed with her about three months and returned home. So he, she sings out praise to God for exalting the lowly. And she's a very humble woman. I mean, she's got the Son of God in her. I mean, today she'd be on Instagram and she'd be making some money, you know. Um, come touch the stomach of the, <laughs> you know, the Holy One and, and uh, whatever. Now, why did she stay three months and return home? Verse 56. I imagine to help with the birth of John. Yeah, she waited till John showed up. They knew how to do math back then. And six months pregnant, had three, nine, John's born. And um, so she she's a, a niece or a cousin, says your relative. We don't know exactly how they're related, but they know each other. Uh, they're 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 the joy of both being pregnant, um, both miraculously, um, 
but one to be known is very public. One is private. Uh, now, Christmas time, we think, well, the public one is Jesus. No, Jesus is is kind of secret in there. Um, no one knows Mary. She's a poor person. Her relatives, no doubt, know Mary. Everyone seems to know Zechariah and Elizabeth. In fact, um, they 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 live closer to the most important city. He served in the temple, and then everyone probably saw him gyrating, and when he couldn't talk, everyone's talking about this birth. So the birth of John the Baptist is a big deal, uh, like Princess Diana having a kid. Yeah. Whereas the birth of Jesus is like Jenny from the trailer park. Yeah, somebody off. And... She's just as important as Princess Diana, but she doesn't have the money and the attention and the fame, and no one notices. So that's where we're at. So next week, John will be born. And then Zechariah will start to prophesy. It'll be good stuff. Yeah, he gets his voice back. Gets his voice back. He's got a lot of buildup in there. Yeah, he's going to say, he's going to say, give me some food. Can you imagine not talking for nine months? Uh, That that was the experience in my mother's womb. I couldn't wait to break out. (laughs) Like, get me out of here. I can't talk. Can't breathe. And I haven't shut up since. Uh, it's came out funny. screaming. My grandfather used to call me the foghorn. And that's what I was. <laughs> Nothing's changed. Nothing has changed. <laughs> my, my mouth is uh, is my greatest tool for all the good that I can do. And it's also my greatest enemy that gets me in more trouble. And um, one day I'll shut up. It's just the way you made you. Just the way you made me. <laughs> all right. So this puts us on a good track to... to be talking about the Christmas story here just like a couple weeks before Christmas. That's great. Perfect. Yeah, that's, you'd think we planned it, which we didn't really. We didn't We're really. We're not as sharp as we look. But you shouldn't have told everybody that. Well, too late. Uh, all right, cultural commentary. So there's always something to touch on in the news. Always. Always. Uh, you know, I think the one thing that you want to touch on this week is just... It's just interesting to me. How... how irrational our culture is now so there's a there's a nine-year-old holden there's a nine-year-old boy holden holden his dad's name is bubba who became famous this week how come your dad named me bubba that's yeah, probably a nickname my grandson zion's nickname is bubba already but heck his mother is a southern girl they like southern nicknames bubba i guess that's short for brother but how do you get named bubba i don't i don't know this I mean, it sounds like you dropped out of a Ford onto an oil pan. Like the, the wife was working on the car and she gave birth. There's Bubba. <laughs> so, so what made Holden? Holden's who we're talking about. Bubba is his father. Bubba. How did Holden become famous this week, Mike? Bu- uh, Mike or infamous? I guess hey, we should let's say. See if I can blow this up since we we do have the ability to see things. Now we're not yet so dialed in. Hey, Cruiser, can they see this? Can they see that? Oh, yeah, could sweet. you do that? Could you put it up there? That's little Holden. And um and 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 what he he is a, a Chiefs fan. Now if you if you follow football, you know that the Chiefs are the Super Bowl champs. And what colors do they have? Red and black. Red and black and gold and white. Um, but red and black. And so he's painted his face half black, half red. He's nine. He, he's a little football player in his little team, the Pirates, back home. And he's he's got a chief Indian hat on, all right? Native American feathered, decorative. Probably similar to the things that they sell in the gift shop at the stadium. Well, yeah, probably. In fact, it was ornamental. Um, it just so happens that his father is from some tribe of Indians. How delicious is Don't that? Don't say Indians, say native indigenous peoples. And his, but even if he wasn't, there should be no problem with a kid painting his face the colors of his favorite football team. And since they're the chiefs, which is a pretty cool thing to be, an Indian chief. Yeah, it's a it's a position of honor. We're not talking about a papoose. It's the president. Here. We're not the papooses. 
That'd be the babies. Yeah. It's the it's go- all Indian lingo for you. I don't know okay. if you know that stuff. No. We're not papooses. We're- it, most Indians don't do Latin, so I'm not as into it. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot. Well, see what a racist you are. They're just as smart as you are. So anyway, um, <laughs> he he's cheering for his team. He gets on national TV, which is he's a cute little feller. But what happens is there's a group called Deadspin, and that's a, a media company, and they like to pick on the sport. I mean, report on the sports world. And they, they put out a tweet that said, the NFL needs to speak out against Kansas City Chiefs fan in blackface and native headdress. They think this guy has both offended black people and Native Americans. Um, I don't know, native. If I was, a, say, a Comanche, don't call me a native. I don't want to be called a native. Uh, anyone who lives anywhere is a native. That's racist. <laughs> the other thing that's interesting to me is, uh, like, the color red it is, is is clearly the color of the red jerseys of the team. Exact it's not color. Like, it's blood red, though. Yeah, it's it like... It is a blood red color. Native Americans don't have Corvette red They do when they're skin. scalping white skins. <laughs> Which clearly this guy is ready to do. So anyway, this kid is up there and he looks cute. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the picture. And then people freak out all over the country and say, how dare he appropriate their culture? Then they find out, well, he is uh, part Native American, indigenous people, Indian, whatever you want to call them. But it shouldn't matter. I don't care if he's a black kid who puts black on one face because most black people aren't really black. They're dark brown or light brown. If he, if a black kid puts black and red, if a white kid puts black and red, I don't care if a doggone Asian kid puts black and red. He loves his stinking football team. Uh, enough, enough, enough. If you think because I'm a pastor, I'm going to say, oh, but someone's feelings hurt and it's going to bother me. You got another thing coming. It's time to toughen up America. It's a kid pretending to be an Indian chief because he likes a football team. Period. Period. I think part of the I think I think part of the the hubbub, the kerfuffle is this is me projecting. I'm imagining that Deadspin is going after this particular person because the Chiefs, as an organization, are the last holdout that refused to change their name. Uh, ah, yeah. uh, 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 Braves. Uh, uh, that's baseball. Yes. Uh, uh, so the the, the Washington uh, uh, Redskins uh, uh. changed their name to the Washington Warriors or something. Commanders. Commanders. Whatever. And uh, they should have went with Commanders. The Chiefs owner got the same pressure, and he refused. This is a nine-year-old. I know. We're going to terrorize a nine-year-old. I think they are terrorizing a nine-year-old. He's a little boy. And it's ridiculous. So this guy's getting harassed now at school, online. And his dad Bubba's getting ready to scalp his, some white folks. His dad, <laughs> his dad Bubba's happy. getting ready to bring down the the uh, legislative <laughs> uh, litigious hammer on people. So 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 listen, here here's This the might end up like the CNN kid is going to end up a hundred millionaire. I hope he does. At nine. I hope he takes dead spin. I don't know if they have any money, but whatever money they got. Crush them into the ground. Crush them. This poor kid. And here's the deal. If, if I had tickets to the Pittsburgh Steeler game this week, which I don't, I would put black on one side, red on the other, get me a Chiefs jersey. They'd say, what are you doing here? Um, I'm saying I'm rooting for the Steelers this week, but I want to look like this kid Holden. <laughs> I'd want to support this kid Holden. So I'm hoping that the next Chiefs game, every doggone Chiefs fan paints half his face black, half his face red, gets himself a feather and sticks it in his hair and goes, ah, 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 ah. So- Look, my favorite team is the Vikings. Vikings. And we still love you, Mike. Are white people. Yes. They're white people. They're way up Did north. Did you know there is stuff. no such thing as people call Vikings? People don't know that. Viking yeah. is a verb. There were, they're normally called Danes. They came from uh, Scandinavia. Mm-hmm. I have that blood in me. I've done my 23andMe. I actually have Native American blood in me, probably an equal amount. I'm both. 
But let's just focus on the that blood, because I have some, and you probably do too. Look at you, white boy. And they came down and they kicked butt. They were they were mean people. They beat up r- the early Russian people who become the Russians. They they beat up the French. They took a whole part of their English, country. beat up the English a lot. Oh, they kicked the Killed English a lot butt constantly. They colonized France by putting a. That's what Normandy is. It was actually a Viking colony, North Country, Normandy. That's why they took it. And they call them Vikings. They don't call them Danes. How dare they call them Vikings? They're white. They're white people. All the white people could be offended. They're not. I love the idea of being Ragnar on the football field. I mean, you can't do it in real life, but doggone it. And I don't care what color the player is. As long as he's wearing purple, he's a Viking. And and if you're offended because that you have Native American blood and you see a kid saying chiefs, Indian chiefs are awesome, then you got to get over yourself because I have no sympathy for you. And as a pastor, I don't think it's unchristian. Uh, you've got to get over yourself, folks. There's too much pride in the in this country. Too many people think they're that important. We're, we don't matter that much. And your skin color don't matter at all. There's only one color that matters, the blood that comes out of the man on the cross, red. And that's the same in all of us. So I, don't, I just don't want to hear it. I'm a Holden fan. This week I'm a Chiefs fan. If, the, if those people will wear these colors on their face, I'm with them. Well, and here's, uh, here's the, like, delicious I don't irony. like the Braves, though. No, I don't like the Braves. don't like Cleveland, that's why. Not because they're Braves. No, not those Braves. The Atlanta Braves. Oh, Atlanta Braves. You're talking Cleveland about Cleveland Indians. The Cleveland Indians. Um, well, here's the delicious irony. They're going to change part. that name. Didn't they change it? I don't know. Didn't they change Cleveland Indians' name, Cruiser? Probably. The delicious no. irony of this is the big kerfuffle online is that look how of offensive this is to Native Americans, and typically it's a bunch of white people presuming that some other ethnicity or they're the guardians. Melanin. Sorry, melanin I have to color skin. The Cleveland is now the Guardians. That's so dumb. Okay. Uh, I'm calling them the Indians. That this other ethnic group or skin tone is going to be offended by this. And then here in this exact situation, the people that were proposedly doing the offense were Indians. Were Indians and they that's weren't kind of, offended at all and didn't that's find it hoot. offensive. They're like, it's like this, guy, this guy's like, actually, the dad w- was interviewed and he said, We don't wear headdresses like that in my tribe, but. I don't think that headdress goes with any tribe. It's just a decoration. Right. It's like the dad is reasonable. He's like, I, so, I am a Native American or whatever we're going to call him. He probably wants to go by his tribal name. And that hat don't bother me. Yeah. <laughs> that don't bother me. If you want to stereotype me as a guy who wears that, I put one on my kid. Look, I got Mexican on my mom's side. Both parents, Mexican citizens, her parents. Um I like great big sombreros, and I don't care if white people wear them and go, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Who cares? They're just having some well, fun. So, <laughs> here's the interest. This, this is what I'm interested. As long to as see. they drink Modelo beer or cerveza. <laughs> <laughs> here's here's the interest. Don't drink Modelo beer. I, I'm interested to or see um, the the cultural moment we're in. Right. I mean, everybody's worried. Christians, I should say, uh, and conservatives are worried about the, the the cultural momentum, the momentum of our culture right now. I'm interested. There's this big move now uh, on the Internet for this weekend for the entire chief stadium to come in red and black you think face they'll do paint. It? And this will it'll be interesting to see uh, yeah. how much of a pushback there I is. I would be so all over that. If, if that whole stadium comes back in support with that's good, good I think that's good news for the sanity of our country to see people saying, "Yeah, this is foolish." If like, I if I live there, yeah. So I, if you if you're going to the Chiefs game, if you live you're probably not listening to, to this, this podcast because this sure. is pretty much Harvest Church podcast. But uh, but if anyone in Harvest Church knows somebody wants to drive to Missouri <laughs> and go to this game, their next home game, paint your face. We will uh, we'll, we will personally gift you the red and black paint. You have to pay all the other bills, but we'll get the red and black paint. <laughs> all right. So with that, I am so excited 
we have questions. a handful of some really good Ask the Pastors questions. questions. Uh, so thank you guys. More questions are rolling in. They've almost all been absolutely awesome. We could spend a ton of time on each one. So I've um, only seen one. So you know. I don't well, know. You've seen two, so I'll remind you. So I'm going to ask the first one because the person asked a few weeks ago. We didn't have time last, uh, last podcast. Um, so I think this is a super interesting question, relevant for the times that we live in. I'm afraid. Would you have fought in the Revolutionary War? Is part A. Would you have participated in the War for Independence? How old am I in this hypothetical? 25. Oh, heck yeah. I think I would have. Absolutely. And, and I'll say that the undertone of the question is, as a Christian. I'm going to kill me some Brits. So why? Walk us through that. Why would I? Yeah. The, you know, a lot of Christians are really, are really hung up on, on violence, you know, enacting violence well, in a fallen world and, and participating in a... Well, that, you're, 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 that's one... What, I'm, I'm stopping you because I think you're about to ask two questions. If you're asking violence, you're really asking, why am I not a pacifist? Yeah, essentially. That's different than the Revolutionary War. I thought it was more to do well, with... Well, I think they're tied together. Okay. So, so, so war in general. War in general. And then the war for independence would be a specific <laughs> subset of the war in general. So they're... Uh, the idea of a just war is ancient Christian philosophy. Um, and there are people who argue about it, but most Christians throughout history have believed in a just war. The idea that we live in a fallen world and um, Paul says that, the, that um, let me read the, the passage that I think rules both sides and, and also causes trouble. Uh, Romans 13, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. And that might be an argument not to fight the revolution if you say, well, the British were our authority. We'll come back to that. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct but to bad would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will win his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Okay, so government has a sword. For what? To... Uh, protect good behavior and punish bad behavior. Yeah. Okay, that's an internal process. To administer God's wrath. But there's an external process too. Government has the same sword. If somebody's coming in from the outside to do bad to me, like perhaps a bunch of Hamas people running into my country, stealing my women and children and killing me in front of my family, the government has a responsibility to protect me. They have a sword. And this is not a... New argument, it's an ancient argument because we live in a fallen world. Uh, an unjust war would be being the Hamas people, going in and killing people without cause or killing people to take their stuff because you're greedy. Uh, a just war would be protecting yourself from the oppression coming from outside your government. And so being a pacifist is not... Uh, uh, Quakers are pacifists, and our our fair state was founded by Quakers because it was granted in England to William Penn. Obviously, the, the Indian tribes who lived here didn't necessarily agree, but that's the way it goes. And the Quakers in western Pennsylvania uh, in the 1700s wouldn't fight to protect their own settlements. And a lot of them angry Indians would come and just whack them. And, and they'd... they'd hurt the economy of the young colony of Pennsylvania, and they'd hurt, kill the people, and they wouldn't protect themselves. So George Washington, who was a young militiaman then, and Ben Franklin, who was a big shot politician then, um, put together Pennsylvania's militia and said, go out there and protect these Quakers. But make no mistake, Franklin wasn't happy. 
he, he said, you guys won't protect yourself. So someone else's blood and money has to do it. Um, he, though not a Christian, Franklin, made the Christian argument. Uh, we should protect ourselves and, and not be pacifists. Uh, there are innocent people. You, you, you can't give way to disorder. And the government is, human government is ordained by God. But human government is just a collection of us humans deciding how to run the show. No different than uh, two brothers who live next to each other determining that they'll protect their families from intruders. You know, just two guys agreeing, let's let's protect. Um, and that's all government is. So we have a responsibility. Going all the way back to Genesis, I think chapter 9 it is, where God said that that all life is his and no blood should be shed by an animal or a man. And if it is, they have to give account. He says, so if an animal or a man kills a human being, that animal or man must be put to death by mankind, not by God. That in, is the institution of human government right there, because if somebody kills a man, he can't enforce his own punishment because he's dead. So mankind has to kill that man, and mankind is going to need governance some sort of agreement, some sort of way of determining guilt, and some sort of way of executing. So the idea that the sword is in the hand of the government to protect internally and externally is not new. So I'm not a pacifist, and that's why. But the second question is about authority, right? Second part of that. Yeah, I mean, so that's that's pacifism versus participating in organized warfare as a Christian in general. So the second one would be, why let's look at the process of the war for independence the revolutionary war i like war for independence better uh because i actually don't think it was super revolutionary um and yeah, I can, we didn't transform england i can explain why i don't think it's a revolutionary war um but then why then would you feel like the war for independence specifically was a just war and in alignment with romans 13 okay so Romans 13 said, subject, submit to your authorities. First, we have to isolate that there are exceptions. From Paul, Paul did not submit to all that his, his authorities said, um, nor did Peter, nor did any of the apostles. When they were told, you will not preach the gospel, they preached it anyway. And they said, who should we listen to, you or God? And Paul himself was often thrown into jail for disobeying authorities so there's another principle in the Bible, and that is you obey the highest authority. And so if your government requires you to sin, you may not do that. You may resist that authority. Now, that may get you beaten. The whole idea of civil disobedience, most which reached its zenith in America under Martin Luther King Jr., though he didn't invent it, but it really reached its height. He made the point that if you obey God and your government persecute you. You should take the persecution, and that's your way of taking a stand. And I think that's fine. I think that's a fine option. Disobey the government, but then be prepared to pay the price. Or you can make war on them. Now, here's where I think things get dicey, and Christians do disagree. And if you disagree with me, Will, or other people disagree with me, I can live with that. But you had subjects of the king who, under British law, were to have a voice. The British law, they took their voice away and they began to govern them without their representation, which they didn't do with those same subjects when they were across the island or across the pond. Second, they were allowed by that government in Britain to, to form colonies. For example, Penn's colony, which were, became Penn's Woods, which means Penn, that's what Pennsylvania, was allowed to have its own government. Yeah, that have their own legislature specifically. Right. And so each of these colonies were ordained by Britain to have their own governments. And if I lived in Pennsylvania then, I would be under a governor and under a king. And if the king says, I'm taking your rights away, and the governor says, we're not going to let you, I believe, I, my conscience could say, 
we're going to disobey that king. Now, that means, just like in civil disobedience, likewise in this kind, we might have to face his wrath. He could send the redcoats to kill me. But I'm saying he's unjust. And that's what, that was the argument our guys made. They said, when in the course of human events, nations find it necessary, and I don't remember how it went, to part ways. It wasn't, it wouldn't be me as an individual. It would be my representative and 12 other colonies' representatives getting together saying we are going to form a nation because our 13 little nations are being oppressed. Yeah. And so I would submit to that nation. And, and here's where having some history really, really matters. The reason I wouldn't call it a revolutionary war is because the, the states had their own charters when they weren't the states at the time, they were the colonies. The colonies had their own charters. That's right. Where they were subjects of the king, but through what is in effect their constitution, so charter, constitution, they had the right, as written, expressed in the British law, to have their own legislatures to administer their own taxes. So that was law, instantiated law in Britain, that they had their own legislatures but were subjects of the king. The legislature in England ignored the laws of England to try to tax uh, the colonies. So it's like a jurisdictional problem. So like, let's give uh, an analogy. You live in Pennsylvania and imagine come tax season, you get a letter in the mail from Idaho that says, you owe me a bunch of sales or a bunch of income tax. And you say, I don't live in Idaho. Well, there is a difference. So Idaho isn't over Pennsylvania, but Great Britain was over Pennsylvania. Well, right, but but um, but they had they had a jurisdictional distinction between the the Parliament in in Britain, the island of Britain, versus the legislatures that were given legislative and tax jurisdiction over the colonies. So it's, it's kind of it's it's not a perfect analogy, but it's a good analogy to we have one federal executive branch over all of the United States, but then we have state legislatures, right? I know we right. have a federal legislature, but let's ignore that for the time being. So it'd be as if Idaho's legislature decided, we have a budget deficit this year. We're going to send a bunch of tax bills to the citizens of Pennsylvania and demand that they pay. And the Pennsylvanians go, whoa, we have our own legislature. We're not subject to Idaho's income tax because we're not citizens of Idaho. We live over here in Pennsylvania and we ha we have a Pennsylvania legislature and, and they're the ones who levy taxes against us. And the important part of the story is that this, the colonies painstakingly appealed through their own governmental systems mm -hmm. in Britain. They sent delegates back to Britain to argue like you're not listening to your own laws on the books. They appealed to the king to stop the British Parliament from trying to levy these taxes. They say, we're not listening to our own rules. We're, we claim to be a nation of laws, right? Where the law is above uh, each individual man and you guys aren't listening to that. You're ignoring, you're ignoring our own rules of conduct here. And the king, they were appealing to the king because they said the previous king, he, he signed these charters in the law. We have these charters, rules for how we're gonna interact with Britain and, and you guys have just flushed them down the toilet without changing the rules. You're just ignoring them, right? Um, so they made a great effort over many years to try to use the systems that were in place to appeal to the, the authorities that were there. So Romans 13, um, that were summarily ignored. It, didn't, it never resolved. And, and that's when resistance so, started. So let's, let's look back at Romans 13 then. Romans 13 says, let every person... Well, Go ahead. I just, sorry, this thought came. We, Please do. We touched on that white flag with the pine tree on it, uh, which, which is, says on, underneath, appeal to heaven. That was George Washington's first, uh, it was, uh, the first flag they put over the first set of Navy ships they made. That appeal to heaven comes from, we've made every attempt to appeal to man. We're at mm. the end of our rope. We're now going to appeal to God. And let's see who wins. So, again, uh, I'm glad you laid that out so well. It says, let every person be subject to governing authorities. 
It doesn't say let every government be subject to government authorities. In other words, when in the course of a human event, how's the next line go? I'd have to look it up. Um, could you look it up? The um, I know that, for example, John MacArthur strongly believes that the the American Revolution, War of Independence, was a sin. I don't agree with him. I'm not saying he's not a Christian, and you might agree with him. I'm not saying you're not, but I don't agree. This doesn't say let every government be subject to every other government. And as Will, you pointed out, this was governments fighting a government. And I, as a citizen of Pennsylvania colony, perhaps I could appeal myself, if I wanted to, to Britain and say, I'm part of, I'm under the king. And then I could have a conscious stand against. But I also would have to make a decision to go against the colony. So I'm going to disobey one or the other. No, you have to. So my conscience has to go with whoever I think is right. And yes, it would be in my interest if Pennsylvania was right, because I'd have more freedom. Um, But nevertheless, that's why I do not think I'd be violating this. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. I'm not going to run off like an anarchist or a terrorist and just fight every British person I see. I'm going to obey the militia and the governor of Pennsylvania, go where I'm told, fought where I'm told, and I'm going to obey what is told to me. And this is, this is the huge distinction between what truly was a revolutionary war in France yes, and what I would call the War of Independence in the U.S. In the U.S., the states are up, they're trying to appeal to law. They're trying to appeal to the law. They're trying to, to respect the laws instantiated by the government. And they're trying to stay a government. When the states, when the states revolted against the king or fought the War of Independence, just as you eloquently stated, they were trying to maintain. They were not anarchists. They're trying well, to maintain. Even, again, though, you're telling me what their states are doing, and I agree. What I'm saying is the, the question for me is what I as an individual, regardless of why my state, my state might have said, we just don't like the color red. Um I still am forced to choose who will I submit to. Right. And and yes, I could uh, appeal to a higher ethic. Well, I'm not going to fight for a country that says they just don't like the color red and I could have civil disobedience. Or I could say, um, okay, that's capricious and I'm going to do it and that's my conscience before God. The point is I have two governing classes here and it doesn't tell me not to... You, ha- you can't submit to them both. You can't submit to everybody. And and since, by the laws of England, I have been in this colony, I would happily, and let God sort it out, like, John, like, like George Washington said. Let's appeal to God. Let's have this fight. Let God sort it out. Yeah. Who wins and who loses? Not up to us. We'll just do our best. And, and this is why I have a totally different opinion about the French Revolution, because that was a revolt against the rule of law. You have a lot of mob mob violence, and it ended up with just a ton of beheading. So you're saying there could never be a revolution in France or any nation under God? I'm not saying that in an absolute sense. I'm talking about that specific one. But I know you weren't. That's why I asked it in absolute sense. <laughs> I, I, um, I don't think, if you narrowly define the term revolution, that Christians should participate in revolution. Now, we throw around the term revolution very loosely these days, so you'd, you'd have to define your terms. But if I define revolution as throwing off all rule of law. Okay, that'd be anarchy. Anarchy, mob rule, rule no... Those are three different terms. They are three different terms. Um, we need some... We need some body to administrate the sword of the wrath of God yes. so that it's not... And the mob sure did in that reign of terror. So that it's not just retributive revenge justice. Okay, here's the... Here, I, I, I got you, and I'm, uh, I'm going to cut you off for the sake of time because I know we went long last time and we're trying to cut that down. But I want to follow up and give you another shot at this. Russia, they says, basically run by mobsters. 
Mexico, perhaps, is basically run by mobsters. Uh, Bonhoeffer tried to kill Hitler because they were run by Satanists, the Nazis. Is there no time to organize a revolt against wicked governments? Absolutely, there is. But, oh, I'm stepping out on a limb here. In, in, in order for me to consider that just war, righteous revolt, you have to have some collective moral structure with which to make decisions about how you're going to go about an abstract moral structure no like a real moral structure like what's what's moral fair play so i could write up 10 rules of i'm not putting up with this crap from the nazis anymore and here's 10 rules why and i sign up 100 no not 10 rules why as we're going to engage with the nazis the people i pull on my team what are our codes of conduct as the opposing force. And I think that automatically puts you in, you're now your own government, going back to your thing. Like, if I'm going to be the French resistance, right, as Nazis are occupying force, what makes us a collective is we, sh- we, share, some, we share some belief system as a moral standard for how we're going to not be Nazis in fighting the Nazis, Right. What makes us different than the Nazis is we think what the Nazis are doing is wrong, So, if, which if, means we have certain limits on let, what we're okay, willing good. to so, do so to let's, not be immoral. You're a French partisan, and you're in the resistance, and we rewrite history, and you put together a group of folks, and you win the day and drive out the Nazis. Yeah. Okay. So was that a revolution? No. Okay. Okay. No. I would say no. I think that's enough. I don't want to split hairs. I just wanted to follow that little bit. It's semantics. But you get what I'm saying. Like, as soon as, if you have to say what they're doing is wrong, you now have a standard for wrong and right. Well, I think, I I don't want to go any farther with this for time, and plus I don't want to lose anyone, but I will say this, that what we've demonstrated here is just because things are plain in the Scripture doesn't mean that everything they touch is simple in the Scripture. There's complexities to this. And I think we live in a great nation because very thoughtful men had these same discussions probably at a much deeper level than you and I are capable of, and they wrote them down. Yeah. We have records, and you and there's still good men fell on both sides. Good Christian men even fell on both sides. Some saying we shouldn't rebel. Some say we should have a war of independence. And, and now we're here. I, the question's to me, would I have fought? Annie, get me my gun. I'm ready to rock. Right. Or it, I would have said, I've just hid and said, you guys go fight. I'm going to sit here and eat ice cream. No, I wouldn't have. I would have ran a fight. The, the interesting thing is the, I don't know if it was the first, there was a, there was a, the Presbytery met, the, the, the. Yeah, the session. The session. The Presbytery session in Philadelphia met the same week that the Declaration of Independence was signed. And I think like 50 of 54 signers of the Declaration of Independence were two days prior at the Presbytery session. I didn't like know that. The vast majority of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were genuine, deeply held Christians that just participated in a, in a Presbytery session. Wouldn't so, shock me. I, I, going on memory, I'm cold answering this question. I think you mentioned it before, but I forgot, so I didn't study it. So forgive me if I'm wrong, but didn't one of the representatives, either from Delaware or Pennsylvania, didn't someone not show up because he knew he was going to vote against and he didn't want to be the one who stopped America from becoming America? I don't know. I'm not familiar with the story. I'm sorry I asked. I shouldn't have asked if I didn't know. All All right. How are we on time there, Cruiser? You want to do another question or save it? We at least need to talk to somebody out there, um, and that's An- uh, um, um, not, not Anderson. We got to talk to um, uh, Richardson. Ty Richardson. Ty Richardson needs to know something, buddy. We did not ignore your question on YouTube. We didn't see it because apparently, 
We didn't know anyone commented on ours. We're just happy you watched. The The person who asked the question that I haven't answered is at PVC. And, and I don't mind the question. It's not a bad question. I just want to know who asked. I think... I, for me, it makes me feel more comfortable to know who I'm answering, especially if it's a question, because theological questions are very important to people. And I can tend to be cavalier and and joking <laughs> even. And I like to be able to follow up and make sure that I'm actually answering the question being asked. But Ty Richardson, we have your question, and it's a long one, and it's a good one. It's a good one. And so. it might be too long for our time, but we will be answering you. Yeah, we don't want to shortchange you. The the Revolutionary War question came in first, and I feel like if we get into your question, Ty, uh, we are going we to answer that question. There's no, we were not ignoring you. Take it. And, and by the way, you asked it beautifully. There was nothing at all in the least bit difficult in your tone. We appreciate a brother should be able to ask difficult, complex questions like this uh, and, and be received happily. The dialogue is how we move forward, and, and we want to look at the Bible and see what it says. So thank you. I'll say I something. guess that's next week for him. Yeah, it'll be next week. And we have, Sorry, dude. We have another one uh, from another member, uh, which is also a great question about motives, how, how Christians should think about or react to their perceived motives when they're going about um, living out their Christian life. I think that's a great question, too. Yeah, motives are hard. We'll, um, we'll deal with that next time, but they're hard. They're a deep well. Hard. If you list, think hard enough about your motives, you always come back to something. You go, well, maybe it wasn't all that altruistic. Right, right. <laughs> You're like, you if just, I look long enough, I become a schmuck again. Yeah. You know, um, I need Jesus. <laughs> so, so we're new to being social media moguls. Yes, and we, we didn't moguls. even think to look at, at YouTube comments. comments. Right. Uh, if you have given a question, on through YouTube. comments, and we haven't uh, we haven't acknowledged that we received it. It's not you. We're morons. We're morons. But we love you. Uh, another way to get questions in is is through the Connect card, through email. email to the office, email any of the pastors. Or write your question on the back of a $100 bill and send it to us here at 143 Reed Road, yeah. and we will get it in Katani. Well, guys, thanks again. We really enjoyed doing this. We're getting good feedback from you guys. Uh, we feel encouraged. And uh, if you have feedback, feel free to give it. We love you all and look forward to seeing you this weekend.